what great peace we have knowing that we have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus and the salvation that we have in Christ. We're so thankful for our Savior, our King, and what he did for us on the cross. And as Brother Bud reminded us, we really do have reason to to be thankful every day. How good it is to be a Christian, wouldn't you agree? Such a blessing to have a peace because of our Savior and what he's done for us. What shall we do? As I think about Jesus, this question, what shall we do, is a question that comes to my mind. And I automatically think about Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost when thousands of individuals, Jewish people, heard the good news of Jesus about his death, about his burial, about his resurrection. And they asked Peter and the apostles, men and brethren, in verse 37, what shall we do? And they responded by telling them, repent and be baptized. Repent and every one of you be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What shall we do? Another man asked a similar question like this in Acts chapter 16. The Philippian jailer who saw this amazing event that occurred, how there was a great earthquake around midnight and how Paul and Silas and the others, he was thinking that they were all going to escape. And yet Paul would cry out to him, sir, do yourself no harm because we are all here. And he would go running to Paul and Silas asking the question, sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's a question that all of us need to ask. Our hope is found only in Jesus Christ. And yet, there is another event, another occasion where this question, what must I do or what shall we do, is also raised, and that's found in 2 Kings chapter 6. So if you have your Bible, open it up, please, to 2 Kings chapter 6. My mind, our minds hopefully have been on 2 Kings for the last two or three weeks now. We have been preaching and studying from the book of 2 Kings. I have to tell you, there are so many amazing stories that we find in this book. We looked at chapter 17 a few weeks ago as we dealt with the topic of idolatry and how the Israelites followed after false gods and they became false. Last week, we talked about Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 5 and another one of his servants, Gehazi, and how Gehazi pursued Naaman for the for the money and the clothes that he wanted to get from him. Greed was his idol god. And he would get what he wanted, but he would lose what he had. And yet, there's more to this story of Elisha. And another interesting story we find in 2 Kings chapter 6 that I know is beneficial for all of us. It's interesting how Elisha, I believe he's only mentioned in Luke chapter 4 in the New Testament where Jesus spoke about spoke about Naaman and what took place with Naaman, the miracle that occurred. So we know that Jesus believed these stories. We need to believe them as well. What we have here is the Word of God, inspired inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so what I want to do, I want to read 2 Kings chapter 6. I invite you to read along with me as we get to this question, what shall we do in the context of what was taking place here? Now the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, Behold, now the place before you where we are living is too limited for us. There were sons of prophets all throughout uh, the, the nation during this time, and so some of them are communicating with Elisha. Uh, we need maybe some bigger space here. Please let us go to the Jordan, and each of us take from there a beam, and let us make a place there for ourselves where we may live. So he said, Go. Then one said, Please be willing to go with your servants, and he answered, I shall go. So he went down, he went with them, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was fell in a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried out and said, Alas, my master, for it was borrowed. Then the man of God said, Where did it fall? And when he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron float. He said, Take it up for yourself. So he put out his hand and took it. Now, that is an interesting story, and that could be a whole other sermon or Bible class study with this floating axe head, this miracle that took place here. 
In verse 8, the Bible says, Now the king of Aram was warring against Israel. And he counseled with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. So we see someone against God's people plotting about how he was going to defeat them. But the man of God sent word to the king of Israel. Now this is where it gets interesting. We know that this king, this king of Aram, he is counseling with his servants. In such and such a place shall be my camp. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Arameans are coming down there. So isn't this interesting? Elisha knows these plans that the king is making. Very much like Gehazi in chapter 5. How did he know about Gehazi running and getting that money last week and the change of clothes? Well, obviously this had to be revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. So now he has this information about the enemies of God's people and what they are planning to do. And so he warned the king, don't go to this certain place. Beware that you do not pass this place for the airmans are coming down there. The king of Israel sent to the place about which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him so that he guarded himself there more than once or twice. Now watch this. Now the heart of the king of Aram was enraged why is he so upset because somehow his plan has been has been made known he's enraged because over this thing and he called his servants and said to them will you tell me which of us is for the king of israel so he's trying to figure out how did the king of israel find out my plans how did he know where not to go and where to go now i love the response here in verse number 12, one of his servants said, No, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. Now, there's, there's a man of God. And he knows what you're saying in private. How do you think that's going to make the king feel? If he's already enraged, and now this prophet knows what he's saying, he's not going to be victorious. And so in verse 13, he said, go and see where he is. Now he wants to find Elisha, and it's not to have a nice little conversation. He's got to take this man out. Go and see where he is, that I may send and take him. And it was told him, saying, behold, he is in Dothan. He sent horses and chariots and a great army there. And they came by night and surrounded the city. Now, when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out, so think about what's happening here. He knows where Elisha is. He wants to take him. He's going to do as much as he can at all costs. He has surrounded the city, the place where the prophet, the man of God is. The servant of God, this attendant that he has, wakes up in the morning only to look out and see, oh, We're absolutely surrounded. And so in verse 15, when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. We get upset when we hear the alarm clock go off too early, right? Or the snooze button or something like that. Or the kids maybe run into our bedroom and wake us up. But think about this. You have horses and chariots surrounding you everywhere. How would you respond? Isn't that interesting? Probably not. I wouldn't either. His servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And there's that phrase. What shall we do? What do you do? What shall we do when we are outnumbered by far? It's me and and the prophet the servant and the prophet, and you have this whole city of horses and chariots. We know the power of, of horses and obviously the chariots as well. And this man only has one mission. This man is only there to destroy Elisha. Now, this is where it gets so encouraging that I want you to take note of. He asked the question, what shall we do? Now I want you to see this great man of God in the moment. It's one thing to talk about certain 
things with respect to God and his power and faith, but I want you to think about what happens when we're in that moment, that crisis, that period of unknown. We find in the very next verse, in verse number 16, he answered. So Elisha answered, he said, do not fear. Really? There's a whole army outside of our place. What do you mean, do not fear? Well, he would go on and say, do not fear. Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, that is really intriguing as well, because maybe the prophet or the the servant of God is asking, who are you talking about? Are you talking about the sons of the prophets? It didn't appear that they were with them. So who exactly, Elisha, are you referring to? Watch this. Then Elisha prayed. So I want you just to think about how this man of God responded in this in this very difficult situation. First, he says something that a lot of us may even get upset about. Do not fear. What do you mean, do not fear? Look at the circumstances. Look how bad it really is. Then he says something to the to the servant, to the attendant, that he probably has no he has no idea what he's referring to. But then Elisha begins to pray and he says, Oh Lord, verse 17, I pray, open his eyes. And that's interesting because he's praying for who? He's praying for his servant. Open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes. And that's really awesome to think about. God answered his prayer. He answered his prayer immediately. The Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Getting goosebumps just thinking about this. If you go back to 2 Kings chapter 2, remember, who had Elisha been with in 2 Kings chapter 2? He had been with Elijah, and he had made this great request to Elijah in verse number 9 of 2 Kings chapter 2. When they had crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, ask what I should do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. He said, you've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me, When I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. As they were going along and talking, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, which separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven. Elijah saw it and cried out, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And so this is something very similar to what he saw back in 2 Kings chapter 2. And so now now the prophet or now the servant of God sees something for the first time. It is like this curtain has been pulled back where now he can see what's really taking place, that they are not alone, that they are surrounded by these horses and chariots of fire. And the only explanation for this is that these have to be spiritual beings, obviously, angels surrounding them, giving them this protection. And it's such a powerful story because Elijah, he prayed that he would see, and now he has truly seen. And so now that's going to change everything about this question, what shall we do, or at least it should. But there's something else that's really impressive about Elisha. Verse 18, when they came down to him, That is so impressive because who has surrounded him? If I'm understanding this correctly, this is the army of the king of Aram. They're coming down to him now. But Elisha, he hasn't budged. He hasn't moved. He's not trying to run away or anything. You see, his confidence has always been in God. His confidence in that moment was with God. He knew that he was not alone. He knew that he had the power of God on his side. So even though the enemy is closing in on them, he doesn't move stands firm and you know what he does again he prays he prayed to the lord and said strike this people with blindness 
I pray. So he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. What shall we do? And there's so much more to this story. We don't have time to read all 33 verses of this chapter, though. But nonetheless, what I want you to see is that that this is a question that was asked. In a moment of difficult days, difficult hours. And the way that this prophet of God responded is so critical for you and for me. And how he encouraged that servant of his not to fear. And what he knew in that moment. And how he responded with prayer. What shall we do? I thought about this as we think about wrapping up this year in 2020. We're not there yet, but we are closer, right? What shall we do? And I'm wondering if there are some in this audience with this many people, I'm sure there are, who may be asking this question, who may be having these kinds of thoughts. What shall we do? How do we respond because of some of the difficulties and challenges and disappointments or death or suffering? that we may be experiencing. What shall we do? As God's people, we need to know how we must respond in these kinds of moments. Because even though Elisha was a great prophet and his servant was with him, with him, and there were still some difficult days that this man of God would face. And as the people of God, brothers and sisters, we are going to face some difficult days as well. What shall we do? Well, you see it all right there on the screen, don't you? Do not fear. Yet when I was thinking about putting this lesson together, I was wondering how often have I said that this year, do not fear. I don't know about you, but it feels like it was so long ago when we were in the parking lot. Do you remember that? I know I did some sermons talking about this idea of do not fear. But if I'm just being honest and straightforward, it's easy for us to say this. It's hard for us to do. But then my next question is, how many times do we have to hear it before we actually start to believe it? Do not fear. So many things that people are fearing at this very moment. COVID is a big one, obviously. Politics is a big one, obviously. Lack of work or maybe their job status or situation, maybe their family, sickness, whatever the case, maybe even death. And yet we are told over and over again, do not fear, which means that this is not just something that is optional. Maybe we struggle with this idea of do not fear because we're not as connected to the one that is the reason why we don't have to fear. Elisha was connected to God. He prayed to God. He put his faith and trust in God. Brothers and sisters, as we think about this idea of what shall we do in these moments of difficult days and hours and years, more than ever we need to be praying. And I cannot stand up here and try to judge your heart. I have no idea where you might be when it comes to your prayers to God. But what I do know is myself, and what I do know is there's way more room for me to be engaged in prayer. Can you say the same? It's not that we don't have enough time to pray. I'm just wondering if we truly understand the importance of prayer. What we all really need is not social media, it's not Facebook, it's not more likes, more follows and shares, and I know I've said this a lot this year in 2020, but I'm getting closer to removing that title that I've given myself, the the Facebook hypocrite. I'm still off of it, thankfully. But there's so many other things that can get in our way. And when I think about passages like Acts chapter 6, 
for myself personally. In Acts chapter 6, when there was a complaint against the Hellenistic Jews, or the uh, you know, part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food, I just love the response of the apostles. They said, it's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. And then in verse number four, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. What did that devotion look like? We have to be devoted to prayer and to the ministry of the word. That is not just something that's going to go by really fast. When we are devoted to something, there is a dedication, there is a, a commitment, there is, there is something that becomes priority, number one for us. And for the apostles, they had it. And for the saints in the first century, they had it as well. In Acts chapter 12, when there was danger, when there was trouble, when Peter was in prison, the church came together. Verse 5, so Peter was kept in the prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church of God. So the church was praying fervently. What Mark read to us from 1 Peter chapter 4, that we need to be serious about prayer. Because when we find ourselves in this or in these what shall we do moments. If we are not involved in prayer, and taking the time to pray. And it may not always end the way that it should. For Elisha, that's what he did. And for Elisha, he knew some things about God. And as we think about our relationship, you know, earlier this year, or maybe just a few months ago, I did a sermon called Philippians 4, verse 8 is not a suggestion. And meditating on God's word is something we must be doing. We must know about who our Father in heaven is. And not just enough where we can answer a Bible class, Bible class question, but when we are in the heat of the moment, when we're in that, that situation where it feels like everything is just kind of coming in towards us. Or maybe the marriage is right on the, right on the edge of, of going down to destruction. Or maybe your faith is on the verge of, of failing. We have got to know our God and who he is and the fact that he loves you and me and all of us. And the fact that we are not alone, that's what Elisha knew. He knew that we were not, he knew that he was not alone. And we need, to, we need to stay connected to our Father in heaven in prayer. We need to know that our Father is with us. And please do not forget that we are in a spiritual battle. We get so focused on the wrong kinds of battles. And the enemy sometimes is just laughing at us. First Peter 5 and verse number 8, he does not stop. While he may have great strength, he is not as strong as our Father in heaven. And we are victorious because of our God in heaven. So don't forget that we are in this spiritual battle. Don't forget that, that we are headed somewhere. Brothers and sisters, we're headed to heaven. We need to remember that. So it doesn't matter what may be happening on the outside all around us. It doesn't matter that it may feel like people are no longer interested in Christianity. Or that people are just kind of falling away. While all those things are important, we need to make sure that we keep our eyes focused on what we know to be true. We know that the tomb is still empty. We know that because Jesus has risen from the grave, we are victorious. And we know that whatever we face in this life, even death, we don't need to fear. But we do need to remember these things. That this world is not our home. As Peter reminds us in 1 Peter chapter 2, we are pilgrims here. So don't unpack and get too comfortable. Live like you're dying because one day you will and so will I. We need to see the bigger picture. The servant couldn't see fully what was all around him and who was with him. We need to make sure that we're seeing with the proper eyes, the proper vision. And when we do, that changes everything. 
what shall we do? As we navigate this world, make sure that we are seeing things with the proper vision, with our eyes of faith, with the assurance and the confidence that we can have in who our God is, that despite the difficulties, the challenges, the setbacks, the disappointments, we're still victorious. Heaven is our home. And we can go there. We will be there, Lord willing. But we must see things for how they really are. That our Father in heaven, He is on the throne. That Jesus is on the right hand of God, is at the right hand of God. That the tomb is empty. And when we focus on that, it will change how we view everything else in this world. But are we doing that? What shall we do? Well, we know what to do. The bigger question is, are we going to do it? The choice is ours. Much like the choice was for those on the day of Pentecost. When they asked, what shall we do? And Peter told them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. They had to make a choice. About 3,000 of them did, and they were saved. Now you have to make that same choice. And if you have, remain with your king. Let's stand and sing.